Thank you so much, Larissa. Thank you so much, Larissa, and to Ben, I know, who may be coming later for the invitation. It really is an honour um, to be talking in this series. Like everyone, Cornell is, you know, a, a bit of a mecca for, for all of us working in this area. Um, so I did warn Ben that this is uh, in progress material. Um, this is uh, going to mostly focus on some research that we've been working on the last um, six months. Um, which is just, you were just preparing for, for publication. So I'm really interested to, to test these ideas out with you all. Um, I will um, I will just give a brief context of the of the sort of area I'm working in. Very, very quickly skip over some some past research. Um, if you look, if you want to find out more, you can look just there's all the papers are all on the internet. Um, and then for the main part, I'd like to focus on our current research, which is trying to look at more dynamical. So taking inspiration from dynamical systems theory, from neuroscience and from complexity sciences more broadly to focus on methods to map, model and measure soundscape dynamics. And I'll introduce some of those um, results and then quickly flag a project that we launched last week, which is a public engagement project in, in listening into to rewilding. So feel free to put, I don't know how you work, feel free if you've got an urgent question, I'm happy for you to interrupt me, else I guess you can post questions in the chat or the rest of we can host them at the end. So I'll aim, I'll aim to wrap up in time to have some time for questions. So yeah, so the, the context of all of all of our work really, I suppose, is 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 global. Two two, as I see it, main global crises. One, one, the, the issue of that kind of, of, of planetary boundaries. Um, global challenges of of everyone's focused on on climate change, but as people in this group know, actually biodiversity loss is an even more serious issue. So there's a global challenge to monitor, understand, and and predict the integrity of our of our biosphere, um, and this is one of the most critical sustainability issues of our time. But one of the reasons I've come to work in soundscape research, and and I, I feel so excited to work in this area, is I think that. That, that studying the soundscape enables us to not only develop scientific tools to address the consequences of, of, of climate change and, and planetary ecological crises, let's say, but I think maybe we can also, through, through listening and through listening to what other people hear, um, maybe we can also address some of the causes. <laughs> and there are many, many causes, but uh, to my thinking, one of the causes is a kind of misplaced um, sense of importance of human beings. So on the left here, we have a, a nice depiction from post beams of the shift, the difference between kind of egocentric and ecocentric. And hopefully this will become apparent in some of my work, that it, this interest in, in shifting back to a kind of ecocentric perspective. And I think this acoustic work is very useful for that. Um, so just really quickly, some, some past work, and some of this is on my website, though I must admit this is terribly, terribly out of date, and I will update this as soon as possible. We have a growing group of people working in what I called eco-listening, so transdisciplinary soundscape research at the University of Sussex. Um, and I guess because of my background, but also increasingly, I really believe it's the only way to work. Um, I'm interested in working at, at human environment interfaces, but bringing in, <laughs> sorry, this is a half-made map, but bringing in um, AI and complexity perspectives with ecoacoustics, and importantly, also traditional ecological knowledge. And I'll come back to that in a minute. And I think these are some of the important challenges, not only ecosystem monitoring and, and fundamental science, but also through this work, we can attempt to address nature reconnection and, and also we're also increasingly working in approaches to kind of commons governance. So some emerging work is around supporting indigenous communities in rights of nature work. So that's a, um, a, a very high level uh, map of the sort of areas which I'm working in at the moment. Just very quickly to give you a, a, a 30 second sort of background in some of to, to tra frame our current work. I came to this world, um, as Larissa said, I studied evolutionary and adaptive systems. So a kind of artificial life, um, computation, ecology, a mix of philosophy, biology and computing in my master's. And it was there that I heard about Bernie Krause's acoustic niche hypothesis. And I thought that was a really interesting idea. For me at the time, no one was thinking about sound as a dimension in evolutionary eco space. The, the idea of a niche in, in soundscape was not really taken seriously by biologists then. Um, so as part of my master's project, it was actually 2001, I think, I made this a little evolutionary system, an evolutionary agent-based model to say, well, you know, is, is this idea of, of niche 
the, um, the acoustic niche hypothesis, is that enough as, a, as an organizing principle in evolutionary terms to organize agents into distinct acoustic niches? So I hope that makes sense. On the left, you've got a, a random population and then through the simple fitness function. So this isn't AI, this is an evolutionary algorithm. You basically, you can only mate if you can hear an organism of a similar, um, of a similar time and frequency and there aren't too many other organisms of a similar time and frequency, a bit like a cellular automata. And, and lo and behold, not surprisingly, you get this sort of nice distribution. I'm going to skip through this really quickly because it's just to give some, some background, but these are all things you can look up if you're interested. We revisited that work um, for an artificial live conference. More recently, um, the original work was purely symbolic. And we, we with, with a brilliant colleague, Chris Kiefer, we made an implementation, a kind of a sonic implementation, if you like, which we described as sonically situated and, 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 and investigated this idea more, more thoroughly um, and indeed demonstrated with a, with a more convincing energy model that even with such a toy model, we can see this kind of spectrotemporal partitioning. We can see recovery from noise events and from, from, from um, um, catastrophic um, population crashes and stuff. So that was one part of it is, is, is simulation and the role of simulation in understanding soundscapes and, and acoustic communities. I then worked in 2014-15. Um, at that point, acoustic indices had been proposed as a proxy for, um, for biodiversity, for various facets of biodiversity, but hadn't really been validated in the real world. So by chance, I fell in with a brilliant conservation biologist and we got some funding to go and uh, compare, compare acoustic indices with species richness across, across habitats. And we'll come back to some of those results shortly. So just this again, this is just a quick tour to flag some of the work I've been doing. More recently still, we, we've, we've, we've developed this idea of um, or, or, or the value, explored the value of working with acoustics as a really affordable method when you're working in community-led conservation. So in 2019, we did some work with a community-led reef restoration in, in um, West Papua and Indonesia, um, looking at acoustic monitoring as a way to support communities um, with their reef restoration programs. I've done some work with in wilderness mapping using soundscape as a way to integrate human perspectives, ecological perspectives and GIS satellite data. And that's ongoing work that we're doing across, particularly in the Arctic and across northern climes. And then increasingly coming back, having worked in the Amazon in a scientific context, got really drawn in, felt, felt the importance of bringing in indigenous perspectives um, and really recognised just how valuable the soundscape is, the study of, a, of an acoustic environment is to bring in these differing perspectives. And during lockdown, um, I was part of a beautiful project supporting some indigenous communities in um, Ecuador to apply for heritage status. So they were, they were wa wanting to gain recognition by the government for their territories. And interestingly, they led that not by talking about the red list species that were present or the particular tree species, but by talking about the soundscape, the importance of the soundscape for them in their um, cultural and ecological heritage. So very, very quick sort of set of cards just to say this is the sort of where I've come from is thinking about simulation, thinking about field work and validation um, and thinking about community interaction and participatory research. And all of this research has led me to where, I, where we are now, I think, um, and, the, and the current focus of what I want to talk on about today is this problem of, of, of biodiversity loss and supporting the numerous multilateral initiatives for restoration. So there's global initiatives um, such as the UN's Decade of Restoration. We have an EU um, biodiversity strategy. In the UK, we now have biodiversity net gain, which means that new building projects need to demonstrate that they're not depleting biodiversity. And we have numerous, um, again, global, European, national and local and regional um, rewilding programmes. And that's really what I'm interested in and at the moment. One facet of our research is how can we support these programmes? What role does acoustic, passive acoustic monitoring in general and soundscape monitoring in particular 
what role does that play in it, what role could that play in supporting the monitoring of these restoration projects for for evidencing their funding and, and obviously addressing their different methods so that's that's not new to anyone here i think again some of this will be familiar to everybody but it's good to recap to bring everybody onto the same page um, I think it's fair to say there are two main paradigms in passive acoustic monitoring now, the first of which people such as Dan Stahl, who I've just noticed is present, um, were pioneers of, and there's obviously now the Merlin app and all of the amazing work at Cornell, hi Dan, um, in automated species ID. So I'm calling that paradigm one and soundscape monitoring paradigm two, which might be um, as a proxy for species richness, which is now questioned through Larissa's excellent work um, and others. Um, abundance, um, certainly soundscape is an excellent proxy for, for ecological status, but there are many, many open questions. Okay. So from, from this soundscape perspective, um, we see the soundscape as this, we recognize it as a dynamic pattern that emerges from the interactions between organisms, physical processes and technological processes. And, and importantly, in this, complexity perspective which we're developing or I, I, I'm kind of interested in exploring the soundscape both reflects and influences ecosystem level behaviors so that, that, that that's the basic you know um, assumption if you like in is that then by analyzing soundscape recordings we can predict indicators of ecosystem health um, including some facets of biodiversity and and ecological status now there's a couple of theories underlying um this approach and again some excellent um an excellent recent review um sensibly critiqued these um the acoustic niche hypothesis this idea that that organisms evolve um in to to um occupy distinct acoustic niches and and the and what falls out of this is the prediction that higher biodiversity will result in higher acoustic diversity i'm skipping over this quite quickly because i suspect it's something everyone's familiar with here um and and this is this is those there are increasingly examples to question this as well as many examples where we can see perhaps this is this is um evident this has been the main focus and founding um sort of foundational theory for uh, soundscape metrics or soundscape indices as they've become to be called um, what's been less developed is um, some fra a framework from Almo Farina and Belgrano thinking about the soundscape as a semiotic space. So this idea of semiosis, essentially, again, it's core to, to bioacoustics, the understanding of signal transfer between two organisms. And their, and their, their developed theory integrates information theory, biosemiotics and landscape ecology to create a kind of organism-centred landscape ecology. So we can think then of the soundscape as a space for multi-species semiosis. Um, and we, we have this, this, this switch between thinking of the soundscape as something that's perceived, an organism-centred perspective, much like Bon Erkskill. So thinking about the soundscape as subjective um, information that enables an organism to, to go about the business of staying alive, mating, avoiding prey, finding food, etc. But, but on the other hand, we have this objective, this sort of external physical soundscape, which is the set of vibrations. If you like, that set of vibrations is, is created through and is also the cause of semiosis, right? So we have this sort of subjective experience um, of the set of physical vibrations of the objective soundscape. And we have the objective soundscape as a trace of those interactions, if you like. So one 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 different a different approach this 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 theoretical perspective um, kind of puts forward maybe is that we can think of um, the importance of information transfer in an ecosystem. We can think of soundscapes as 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 flows of information and sets of information transfer which underpin ecosystem function. And we'll come back to these ideas um, at the end. Okay, so there's two theoretical perspectives. And currently our methodological perspectives, um, one I'm calling method one acoustic indices. So these are the simple audio features um, that provide statistical summaries of, of, of audio samples. Uh, what's shown here is, is some plots of acoustic indices calculated every one minute um, through the day on a 24 hour cycle um, with the red line you can just see um, dotted at, at dawn. 
Um, the, the, these we can we know that these type of indices track diurnal changes in some situations correlate with species richness, with vegetation structure, with habitats, with habitat status. These are very, very crude, even intuitively, we can see problems with them. Um, but it's surprisingly powerful in combination. There are, however, many inconsistencies, which Elsa Sayer tells paper has recently um, surfaced. Here's an example of how powerful these can be, even very, very, these very simplistic indices, if you, if you combine them into a multivariate uh, measure, um, we can classify habitat incredibly accurately. So on the left-hand side, we have um, confusion matrices for sets of species. So there's three habitats here. Um, a, a forest is the primary one, a regenerating area, and a farmland, a degraded. So you've got a gradient, of, uh, a gradient of degradation, and the, and there's a. This is for a multivariate classification of those three habitats. If we do that by 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 um, species, we can see that. So the black horizontal line is telling us that there's pretty good accuracy. We get a fourteen percent error rate and twelve percent in Ecuador. If we do that using a set of acoustic indices, we get we we actually get even lower error rates. So there's something interesting going on. This is what first turned me on to using acoustic indices, even though they're so simple, is that we can really, really accurately, we can classify habitat status, ecological status, more accurately with a soundscape, the description of a soundscape than we can with a set of species, okay? More recently then, as well as these kind of hand-built um, indices, we can learn representations. So early work of this was done by Sarab Seti, and you've had some other brilliant people on, on deep learning. So all of this is just, to, to provide some context. Um, the early work used a CNN, so a pre-trained neural network, to learn a set of features. Some of the work we're doing at the moment, um, I've got a brilliant PhD student, Kieran Gibb, who's here maybe, um, is working on using variational autoencoders so we can create a self-supervised and interpretable set of learned features. I hope this is all. I'm, I hope this is all okay. Going over these quite quickly. I think it's all um, familiar ideas, just to give the context. And and with these learned features, we can we can um, we can predict. We can we can recognise um, various again like um, types of habitat quality, diurnal patterns, seasonal patterns. So we're capturing something useful. We're capturing some useful information about the soundscape. We can even um, predict species occurrences. Okay. So all of that to say, we've got these two different ways of, of learning, um, of describing soundscapes at the moment. We've got acoustic indices and we've got learned features, but there's quite a few issues with these current methods. One of them is that if we're concerned about um, restoration, um, then counting species may, be not, may, be, may not be enough. Simon Levin pointed out that, or it's, it's kind of long understood in ecology that the essential dimensions of diversity extend both above and below species. So we're always gonna to need to count species. We're always gonna to need to use species ID, but there may well be other ways of exploring ecological status um, and monitoring rest, um, ecological health other than counting species, okay? And forgive me, my slides are hastily made. This is a plot from Alsa Sayre et al's paper last year, um, demonstrating that acoustic indices, so this is a, a, a meta review of about 50, um, 50 plus projects. And they, what they demonstrate is the fundamental assumption of acoustic indices is that acoustic diversity equals biodiversity. And that doesn't seem to be holding up empirically. They also provide some excellent um, critiques of the theory underpinning this as well. What I want to focus on today is 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 this is a, is a shift, as well as the as well as theoretical and empirical issues with these current approaches. One of my big sticks with it is ecosystems are complex, dynamic, and unpredictable. Soundscapes sound is dynamic and flows in space and time, and yet all my, all of our current approaches focus on or primarily focus on taking very short segments of one minute acoustic indices or in, in learned features, often less than, less than a minute, 96 seconds um, of audio. And then we analyze those independently. Also, Sarah Tell also point out that there's real issues with pseudo replication in this approach. But to my mind, I may be coming from dynamical systems approaches and coming, being a musician, there's, we really, what we're really missing is the measuring of these dynamics in soundscapes. 
this is a the the, the importance of restoring um, complexity is being um, talked about a lot in all literature for ecosystem restoration programs, um, and this is this is what motivates our our current research. So we've had a, a pilot the last few months um, to start exploring approaches to measuring the acoustic dynamical complexity. And, and this is a, a collaboration with some really brilliant people, a mix of neuroscientists, um, artificial intelligence researchers, mathematicians and, um, and music AI specialists. And so we're bringing in inspiration from neuroscience, from complex systems, well, from com neuroscience as a complex system, um, and drawing analogies between, between these systems to see how we might go about measuring dynamics. So understanding um, complexity in ecology is nothing new. This is something ecologists have scratched their brains about, heads about for a long time. And, and we, we understand there's different ways to measure complexity. So we can measure temporal complexity, spatial complexity, structural complexity, or distributions of, of features um, and each different um, uh, complexity, complex systems have quite a specific signal, if you like, of, of complexity. Taking inspiration from, from artificial intelligence and thinking about good descriptions, we can think as well, we've, we've, been, we've sort of inherited acoustic indices, the first generation, we've started learning um, to, we've started developing learned acoustic indices, but it's useful, I think, to stop and think, what is it we want? We want to describe the soundscape. What are the features that we want of our description? Well, we want, to, we want a signal that we can, is useful for making representations and tracking changes, because that's what we need to know to understand the impact of climate change and the positive, hopefully, effects of ecosystem restoration. We need good predictive power. We want things to be sensitive to interesting parts of the signal, robust to noise and parsimonious. We don't want overly complex representations. Importantly, we also want it to be interpretable. So rather grandiosely, I'm suggesting we might have a, a third paradigm rather than rather than species ID or, or, or um, describing short sections of features. So having short term acoustic features. How about describing the dynamics of those features? How can we go about how, how might we go about that? So all of this work we're doing is looking at um, using using a data set from a classical ecological setup. So in ecology, if you want to understand ecosystem restoration, you typically do a time for space substitution. We can't explore. We can't have experiments that are a thousand years long or even a hundred years long. Even ten years is too long for funding cycles. So we so we have instead a gradient of, of habitat status or degradation from agricultural land through regenerating to forested. Just to give an idea of our setup, this is the each of our sites is about a kilometer square with a 15 recorders sitting on each site. And we have three sites in the UK and three sites in Ecuador across a gradient. So in this current project, what we're asking is, is let's, let's just have a, a wild sort of exploration of different ways to map, model and measure soundscape dynamics. One of the things we, aren't, we know about um, complex adaptive systems is that complexity happens across scales, right? And that's one of the, one of the difficult things in complex adaptive systems it, is knowing what the right spatio-temporal resolution is to sample at. Under other approaches, that's really problematic. So if you want to look, I don't know, for example, um, forecast tipping points in fish stocks, how often do you go and catch the fish? Uh, do you do it every day, do it every week, do you do it every, you know, it's, it's problematic. And to my thinking, that's one of the fantastic and powerful things about acoustics is we can record at 44, 48,000 samples per second. And then, but we can take one data point per year or per month or per year, you know, per week, per day, per 10 years. So we have this, and similarly in, in, in spatially, we can, we can record every 150 meters or every kilometer. So we have this amazing possibility um, for uh, spatio-temporal resolution and exploring different spatio-temporal resolutions. So as a very first step, um, we're just having a we're having a, 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 a quite a wild, to be honest, quite a wild explore of different timescales. So looking at thinking, what are the important ecological timescales of in, what are the timescales of interest in soundscapes? And first of all, looking at um, temporal deal patterns, looking at choruses so looking at the scale of hours looking at the, uh, the dynamics of choruses 
and looking at minutes, a very short temporal dynamics. And, and forgive me, this is all in progress. So I haven't got I haven't got perfect diagrams yet. They're all a little bit in progress, so a bit hand wavy. Hi, Ben. Um, so rather than cut what we do currently, then I hope this is a familiar descript, um, depiction to all of you. We have a, 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 a we have a waveform. Often we create a spectrogram. So this looks continuous, but in fact it's a grid, isn't it? It's a it's a just a matrix of values of our of our magnitudes at different at different frequencies and times. Um, and although we can get some temporal information from this, really it is it is discrete. You know, we always have to have that. I think that's trade-off between time and frequency resolution. But then what we what we'll what we what we do is then from this, either for, directly from the time domain or from the spectrogram, we can calculate a bunch of indices. What we've done in this project is 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 you is calculate a few of the common soundscape indices. So acoustic evenness, bioacoustic index, acoustic complexity index, spectral entropy, and temporal entropy. And I'm 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 a big fan of of the most cost effective computing we can get. Um, so also calculating some very, very cheap, um, you know, more basic descriptors, zero crossing rates, spectral centroid RMS and spectral flux. And so what we would normally do, this is for, for, for one minute, this is the same sound sample given for one minute. What we'd normally do, right, is, is calculate these and then have some kind of a number which describes that one minute. And then for those 15 recorders in each woodland, we would sample through the day. We might have some, you know, some tens of thousands of one minute samples and we'd put them all into a regression model or classification model or whatever type of model. And, and we have we have captured some information there. But firstly, as Elsa Sarah Tal point out, there's some issues of pseudo replication. And secondly, we've chucked out all information of time, right? We've, in, in summarizing that one minute, embodying it down into one minute, we've lost an awful amount of information. And we've also dropped all information about the spatio-temporal relationships between those one minute segments. And um, Dan might correct me, but currently that does seem to be a, a, a current a, approach, a core approach in, in deep learning approaches as well. We have these sort of segments of these spectrograms and we feed in distinct spectrograms into a CNN or a VAE or whatever model we're using. Um, and, and we're losing this the, the temporal information. So that's what this project is all about. How can we start to describe the dynamics of soundscapes rather than throwing away all that information? And so the first sensible step to do seems to be to say, well, let's be agnostic to the feature Let's make let's explore methods which enable us to plug in any feature and look at ways of measuring the dynamics of those features. OK, so if we want to if we want to measure, um, if we want to explore deal patterns, variations in dawn and dusk choruses in day and night, um, then Michael Towsey's um, long form spectrogram was a really good um, development. And we can see this really nicely and really it's a really nice way to visualize um, the changing changing patterns but we can't we can't then use that to measure that's not very useful to plug into a model and, we, and we're realizing more and more um more and more research across biomes both above and below ground is showing us the importance of deal cycles i know this is a pet topic of ben's as well um so just i've just grabbed a few example plots here from one from jenna lawson's um project looking at um the impact of human intervention on deal deal cycles so again this is this is this one minute one minute sections that put it pulled into a glm and we can see a pattern this was um, published i think an hour before this talk by ollie and other colleagues ollie metcalf and colleagues looking at soil um deal patterns and again you're recording recording individual one minutes and then using a glm or something similar so we can see the patterns um but 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 what we can't do is then investigate how that changes over time. So if we're interested in, in and this is an open scientific question, the relationship between the deal pattern and ecosystem status, but, but we can have an intuition that there's some interesting information in those dynamics, in the, in the dynamics of the, of the deal cycles, if you like. So the first thing we looked at was, well, a simple question. How do, how do we best, how do we best, rather than having a bunch of one minute um, values and chucking them all into a model and throwing away time, how could we preserve time? How could we better represent time across the day in a way that we can also put into a model? So we coined this is a bit of a joke, but our brilliant postdoc David Kadish. Um, this is an astronomical histogram, 
and so he's coined the astrogram so so each of these this is for uk and this is for ecuador each of these you can think this is a 3d histogram so this is a histogram of values from values from naught to 10 and dawn dusk day and night right and the the brighter the dark blue is is zero and it's a funny color scheme where we've got some jumps but 100 is is red okay so the lighter the pattern, just like a heat map, the lighter the pattern is a higher value. So it's a, you could also imagine it plotted as a 3D histogram, right? So all, so all you're doing is saying, well, let it, have we got a way to, you can imagine you can, imagine you can also then um, animate, animate these and see an animation of these through time. So all it is is a very simple uh, visual representation of that deal pattern, but it's quite expressive. It's both quite compact and quite expressive. So just just to clarify how that's made, you 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 again you have your have your audio calculate a feature, do that however many thousands of times, however many samples you've got, you could then create a histogram right of the values that you get, but instead of having a single histogram for the day, you then divide that hit you have then have four histograms, one for each part of the day. I hope, I hope that's clear. What why why we think that's interesting is because. You could then that also that not only does that provide provide a very intuitive and expressive representation visually, but then that's also a really nice um, representation that you can put into a logistic regression model, for example, um, in order to test the value. So so our so our hunch there was that the astrogram <laughs> would be a more expressive way to represent the soundscape of a day. Um, it would be more expressive and it would also it would ca in, in, in that it would capture the variation and therefore capture the characteristics of a given of a given soundscape um this is also it, sorry this is the, this is also appealing because because it, um you can have multiple distribution multiple mo nodes modes in your distribution right you're not you're not fixed to a um um you're not making any assumptions about the distribution of your data so in in these ones we're 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 just binning the feature values into ten equally sized intervals, um, and then calculating the astrograms. We did that for all of the nine features that we used independently. So if we you imagine there was um, I showed you the map of the forest where there's fifteen recorders. We recorded over a, about ten days at each site. So there's ten days for each recorder. That's and you're aggregating over all the days and all the recorders. So you've got a, a kind of overall astrogram for each for each site. You can also look at you could also just aggregate over days or just over recorders and see what what how you know what's the difference in daily dynamics. What's the difference in the dynamics across a, a, a given habitat? So our hunch was these were more expressive and therefore a, a better a better tool to predict ecosystem status. And this strip plot shows you um, the results of that. So this is using the astrograms um, versus a histogram so those just those four astrograms combined versus simple summary statistics so um, mean variance ketosis and skew I think and that's the accuracy for a multivariable logistic regression so the green ones the astrograms you can see are generally I think in every case actually I think for every index a more a, a better a better predictors so that's very 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 simple tool but 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 we thought we thought actually not something we'd seen before and potentially quite an interesting way to both visualize um and and um, model um soundscapes to start to capture the dynamics okay so the next one is looking at chorus dynamics so going from the day down to a couple of hours again this is sort of how we do it currently we might zoom in and say we've got you know the chorus starts at this time it might start off with with some more um slightly more random calls as 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 as, as species are vocalizing for territorial defense that we might get into um into um dyadic calling later on there's what almo farina calls the post chorus period as well um um, we don't currently have any better tools, as far as I know, and I'm really interested to hear from from, from you if, if we do, um, for understanding the dynamics of those of those choruses beyond simply lining up our one minute samples in a row and, and looking at that pattern through time. So here I took inspiration from dynamical systems theory. This Lorenzo tractor is probably familiar to lots of you. It's a beautiful butterfly of a, of a strange attractor of the, of the Lorenzo tractor. Um, 
but so I've used it as quite an iconic example to help anyone who's not familiar with with phase portraits what this is doing this is giving us a geometric representation of the trajectories of this system in the phase plane so so the axes here are just is, is a time delay so if you think of a time series like like an audio sample right you can if you plot a, if you well the yeah this is this is lagged versions of the same time series so it's showing how if you think of a sine wave if you plotted a sine wave in this space you'll get a perfect circle yeah um and and theoretically it's been shown that you can reconstruct this phase plane this this it's the 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 attractor the geometric representation of the attractor you can reconstruct it from the time series data as long as your time series data is is uniformly sampled which of course with a dynamic with a with a digital audio recorder it is so a, so a digital audio sample the digital audio recording is the perfect time series for for this method um when you when you reconstruct your attractor and the, there's a bit of maths that was done you know a long time ago in the 50s and 60s which shows that um this is diffeomorphically which is lovely uh, lovely term this is showing that if you if for a given time delay and dimensionality you can you can create this low dimensional attractor which which, which represents the true attractor underlying that system that generated the sound okay um I haven't got time to go right into it, but hopefully that thinking of a thinking of a pendulum or a, of a circle, and then yeah, hopefully that you can understand. So if we can, this is the three dimensional phase plane, and these are two D projections. So this is just time against lag time plus t, yeah. So it's time series lagged against itself. So so what this was this was very useful in this was early chaos theory um, and it was shown that very very turbulent dynamics were actually driven by very simple attractors as i understand this is used in bioacoustics so for analyzing things like dog barks and and some primate screams i've seen analyses of these so you can understand an incredibly an apparently chaotic signal arising from a simple system but i haven't but i haven't yet seen it applied to um choruses and one of the things that really hooked me into this um, was was doing the first field work I ever did up in the cloud forest in Ecuador and just just being so struck by what I can only describe as the coherence of the soundscape the species there the wrens there don't just duet they like non it <laughs> there's like you, you think it's you, you hear a call and then you realize it's like in surround sound around you because it's nine different birds all, all somehow calling together and there's this incredible yeah the coherence was the only word I had and I tried I tried to get um various uh of the ornithologists in Ecuador <laughs> to to quantify chorus coherence and they just said okay they would say what, what are you talking about I've no idea what you're talking about but what I've realized is that actually this this approach so we can draw these pictures and we can also quantify it um, precisely to fight to write um, provides a way to look at dynamical coherence so if we do that for um dawn choruses this now what we're looking at here is a is a one hour recording of so you take a one hour recording and then the rms so just the root mean square just the the, the variation in amplitude of that recording um i think in this in this example you do that every second yeah, so every second you take an RMS value and then you lag it a 50% overlap. Okay, and then you have a then you have a string of numbers. And then you plot, and then you do the bit of math which tells you what the lag is, what your what your time delay is. And then this is just the, the value plotted against the lag of itself. Yeah. So the value at time t against the lag against the value at t plus n, where you estimate n with a different value. And and this is early this is early results. I need to thoroughly thoroughly check all this, but there does seem to be quite an interesting pattern emerging, which is which is where in in the primary forest. So this is this is the Shokoan, so not the Amazon. So on on the other side of the Andes in the Shokoan rainforest, we see these quite tight limit cycles, right? So um, we, this this is suggesting if you imagine if you remember that a sine a sine wave would be just like a circle would be well an ellipse. So this means that we've got a repetition. Um, essentially, it's just it's just looking at the time. It's just the the um, yeah the, the, the signal lagged against itself. 
And so all it's saying is that there's a periodicity here. And it, it might it might be as simple as that that's the insect chorus, right? That that's a that's a very coherent insect chorus. If on the palm oil plantation, where and again I need to compare these, the actual species list in terms of species richness, there wasn't a huge difference. There's there's a difference in the in the actual species, of course. There's more more indicator species in the primary, but the actual diversity of species isn't isn't that much different in the palm oil plantation. But but look, the but the attractors is very different, very scribbly, and these arms go up wider. Very there's there's none of this kind of cyclic. And in the it's too, this is too good to be true, so I do need to dig loads more. In the regenerating areas, we see we see the kind of a mix, some some hint of of a cyclic attractor with this sort of slightly messier. And and all this is right. All this is is saying that 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 the values varied smoothly. This is saying that that consecutive values were different. Yeah. And it, just to give some other examples, so so again in the primary, you've got you can imagine this in three D. I think it's probably a bit like an ice cream cone, right? I've plotted it in two D. Just so so this is another cycle. We see the same scribbly mess in the palm oil, and we see this sort of a bit of a mix of the two in the regenerating. Um, so we can we 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 can visualize these, and they're quite compelling. And I've done I've calculated a few hundred now, and they it does seem to be following this pattern. Um, and I find them just really beautiful as well. I think they'd be amazing, like 3D prints. Imagine them like 3D printed in an exhibition space. But my colleague Ivor, who's an AI expert, he's just like, okay, but that's just a picture. We need to. How do we quantify it? Well, luckily there is there is a way to quantify um, attractors, which is with the Lyapunov exponent, which is a, an indicator of chaos. What the Lyapunov exponent is basically doing is just it's a vector based method where you're basically looking at the divergence of those vectors. So again, if you if you had a complete circle um, that or a limit cycle attractor that just focused around the same loop or went into the center, you'd get a lower value if you which way around is it? Can't think now, sorry. But you get different, yeah, you get a wildly different value than if you have just this random scrawl like you see in the palm oil plantation. And lo and behold, we do see some differences. This is this is Again, not not really really preliminary. This is this is Ecuador, so the primary, the secondary, and the silver pasture. We do seem to see some differences, um, but that's not yeah not yet finished. But quite interesting to see. What what really makes me happy <laughs> is that Lyapunov, a very perhaps the best description of what Lyapunov exponent is measuring is dynamical coherence. So it's saying you know how well does the system retrace that same trajectory. OK, and then we I know we, we're nearly finished, but then the last little section that is we've gone from day patterns to choruses. And now we're looking at, at minute by minute. Um, but this approach could be scaled up to any to any time scale. So thinking about temporal complexity and of course, there is a temporal there are there is um, a com temporal complexity metric in the original acoustic indices, which is entropy of the of, of a, of a waveform. Um, but it's quite problematic for a number of reasons that I haven't got time to go into here. <laughs> so um, taking inspiration from neuroscience, some colleagues, so this is from, from, from partners on the project, um, even using very, very simple measures of complexity, um, they have shown that you can differentiate brain dynamics um, in different states. So um, sleeping, anesthesia induced um, sleep um, and, and awake. Um, using um, Lempel-Ziv complexity. I'm really sorry, I didn't finish my slides and write that one there. Um, so Lempel-Ziv complexity, which is one of the simplest complexity measures, it's what's in the zip when you have a zip file, right? So it's saying, how, how much can you compress the information in a string? So you take your feature, you binarize it. So you say 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Um, and then the positive algorithm goes through and it says, how many different patterns are there in that 0.01111 string? Yeah. And the number of different patterns becomes a dictionary of, of, of words. And the higher the number of words, the higher the positive complexity. So um, this is type one positive complexity algorithm, which, which will be, as you think you can probably imagine from that short description, is, is maximizes for randomness, which is not ideal. But we're going to go with it because, again, for 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 parsimony, it's a it's a nice simple first step. So in our approach, what we do is is take that 
take the features, binarize them, calculate length positive complexity, make our lovely astrograms for each day. And then we then the question we're asking is instead of just taking instead of just um, calculating a feature on one minute, what if we also consider the, the complexity of features over a longer period of time? Does looking at the complexity add any information uh, to the to in this case ecosystem status to our ecological variable of interest? Does it add in information? Does it does it enhance our our prediction? Um, and again, this is still um, early results, but this is this is our each of these dots is a different feature. Um, and so there's a few thousand results for each of these dots. Um, the green ones are the astrograms. The red ones are the lempel ziv complexity. So you can see on their own, they actually looking at looking at the lempel ziv complexity gives us less information than the than the raw features. But perhaps not surprisingly, if we add them together. Then we get this we get in general a higher um, prediction accuracy so again this is this is a, a method that we could use with any features we could use learned features we can do it on any time scales we've been looking at one minute but you could look at on days or hours um, and this general idea of saying okay we've got these features we've got these low level descriptions of acoustic of the soundscape but let's not stop there let's look at the dynamics of that so we've looked at deal patterns with astrograms, we've looked at the choruses, and we've looked at these at, at temporal complexity. Um, to summarize then, what, what, we, what maybe we're suggesting is that we go for a shift from looking at acoustic diversity as a proxy for biodiversity to looking at the soundscape dynamics and complexity, and the dynamical complexity talk is a whole other one, <laughs> looking at the dynamics and complexity of a soundscape perhaps then as a proxy for complexity of an ecosystem. So the conceptual basis then is thinking of the soundscape as a semiotic interface, as a, as a, as a place where information flows, and of thinking of the soundscape as an emergent property in the, in, the, in the proper complex system sense, emergent property of the ecosystem. So, so really core cool questions then, which I don't yet have the answers to, but, but the, the value of work in this direction rests on is, is understanding the relationship between soundscape complexity and eco uh, ecosystem complexity and also then the relationship between ecosystem complexity which is seen as a good thing because uh, increased ecosystem complexity increases the emergent properties of stability resilience provision of services that we all need to keep alive um, is there a relationship between the soundscape as an emergent property and these other um, emergent properties so some big questions to finish um, and this is by no means my work on my own. This is an amazing group of people um, at Sussex, as, as, as well as um, Adam Barrett, who's a complexity scientist, David Kadish, who we recruited from Sweden, and is now back there. Uh, Chris Kiefer, who's a brilliant a music AI researcher, Anil Seth, who's a neuroscientist, and Ivor Simpson, who's an um, AI expert, and some other uh, some early career bioacousticians as well joined the team. And the, all of the data was collected from a different project with an equally brilliant group of people. Um, yeah, finally, I will, I'd like to do a plug for Wilding Radio, which is a, a long-term ecological stream that we've just launched um, on Friday, um, which is just an, an open stream, um, uh, yeah, a, a, a long-term audio stream, stereo in the air, stereo underwater, which lets you listen in to positive ecological change. Any questions? Sorry, it was so quick. <laughs> Alice, thank you so much for this amazing and impressive presentation. Uh, I, I'm quite impressed with this new paradigms or this new opportunities to create and shift paradigms in soundscape ecology and ecoacoustics. Uh, yeah, so anyone has questions to Alice? Also, just a reminder that we are going to put this presentation, the recorded presentation in our YouTube channel and in our website later. I have a question. Can I just jump in? Yes, for sure. 
Hello. Uh, hi, I'm Carly. Um, hi, Carly. I, this kind of blew my mind and like, I should have paid more attention in AP physics. Um, I saw your chat. I saw your post in the chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the like phase stuff. Uh, still, I don't think like I wrapped my mind around. Um, what What are you? Is this all being like coded in like just Python or like ha, ha, how yeah. is this all? Yeah, yeah. So we'll release we'll release libraries for everything. We'll release all the code. Um, okay. all the books. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, Ben, are you talking and you're mute? No. Sorry. I have a question, but it's also kind of a commentary, a doubtful commentary. Hmm. So I really think it's an amazing solution and alternative to bring in this and change this ego to ecocentric uh, perspective in humans. And Possibly the use of sounds is like a, an amazing tool for this purpose. So do you know if humans, when um, exposed to different sounds that reflect different regeneration stages, uh, they can themselves interpret this complexity and determine whether these sounds are coming from? So if it's a degraded side or a pristine yeah, yeah, side. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. It's a really good question. And I think there's some there's some research, some funded research, research funded by our main UKRI um, funders at the moment in the UK, um, looking at, at Simon, I've forgotten his surname, Simon, sorry, I can't remember his surname, um, looking at, the, so it's called um, valuing soundscapes and it's looking at the interaction between um, soundscape complexity and and human health so on the one hand it's saying um what's how do we value soundscapes with high and higher and lower biodiversity and then they've also they're also doing this kind of national scale map between complexity of a soundscape and um i think i think like amount prescripted antidepressants or something um but but they but they are using complexity there in terms of like the acoustic complexity almo's existing complete complexity uh, com acoustic complexity index or uh, traditionally i think or in the current paradigm ecologists tend to when they say complexity often mean diversity only right rather than any of this dynamical stuff um so no it's I, as i understand it that's not an experiment that's been done but i think it would be really interesting um to explore that and to explore not only kind of self-reported, but kind of physiological. And even there's ways to do micro phenomenology of the of felt experience. Um, Cause there is something, I think everyone here probably appreciates there's something very profound, something very deep, isn't there about being in those, in those ancient and the, and the kind of more stable, stable, um, more complex <laughs> soundscapes. So, sorry, long answer. Um, I don't know that it's been done yet, but it's a really, really interesting question. Thanks, Alice. So Glenn has a question as well. Yes, Alice, hi, how are you doing? Um, my name is Glenn, I work at uh, Macaulay Library, which is a big uh, reference library of, of, yeah. of you know, uh, natural sounds, especially birds. And so I'm coming at, at this talk from like a very like species centric, like we need to figure out the ideas of species and figure out how many species are in recording that, that kind of thing. And and I hadn't really thought much about bio, uh, bioacoustic indices at all. And so it's really interesting to see this other perspective. And so I guess I'm trying to understand kind of your views on these indices. Are these like proxies for what we actually care about, which is just straight up like species lists from these, from like audio data or from any kind of data? Or are they like actually like revealing axes of like biological axes that we should be caring about that aren't species lists, but that are still important. We just haven't had access to those. Like this idea of like, I don't know, kind of the instinctness of a, of a chorus or of a, of a soundscape, like mm -hmm. in the Choco, I thought that was like a really cool perspective that if you just got a list of species, 
you wouldn't really get at that what you were showing yeah yeah so I think and there's been a lot of just debate around this um thank you Pooja um there's been a lot of debate around this and, and as I say a really great paper which I will I saw someone ask for pdf of the slides I'll probably reference the work because there's a really good meta review by Al Sosser et al Larissa were you on that that, that meta yes. review? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Larissa was also a co-author on that um which question so the, the original idea of those acoustic indices um the soundscape indices were that they could be a proxy for species richness for example and certainly and that's based on that acoustic sorry um, that's based on the acoustic niche hypothesis idea that you that, that that you'll get that higher acoustic diversity is related to biodiversity um but there are some problems with that approach, all sorts of problems. And so, yes, on the one hand, that is what that is one approach to say in some contexts, soundscape indices can be a kind of rough and ready proxy for things like species diversity, species richness, right? And there, there are definitely situations in which that does work. Yeah. Um, I'm also pretty convinced or definitely interested <laughs> in the possibility that measuring soundscapes and if we can get the right um, descriptions and the right features and then the right um, ways to measure the dynamics, that there's other information that we can access. Yeah, that's complementary to, doesn't replace, but is complementary to those species lists. Yeah, thank, thank you. But obviously, it's impossible science because you're trying to validate something which isn't, doesn't, uh, isn't otherwise measurable. So it's, it's kind of tricky. Yeah, this idea of like, being able to measure the synchronicity of a duet or something like that it's kind yeah. of hard to know <laughs> yeah how synchronous something is yeah yeah as and some, someone's put in the chat there there are there are lots of examples of um other other types of statistical complexity and and there are there are a whole bunch of other different um complexity methods that can be used that's definitely is really interesting and alma who's here also has also done some work on fractal indices um there's lots and lots of work in, in this in this direction, which I think is is super interesting. Yeah, thank you. And th thanks for the papers, everyone. I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at those. Sounds like it's a big, uh, hot debate. <laughs> OK, we may have to wrap up. I'm afraid I think I've got to go to a very boring meeting, but um, <laughs> maybe one more. If there's one more question, I'm happy to reply otherwise do you have a do you have a, a forum or a, a forum for forwarding for questions advice? to you yeah or well, just not forwarding to me but just for me to engage with as well like do you have a or do you use the bioacoustics general discussion yeah. we have a yeah we have this sort of list server as well and I'm not sure if you're there if you're not we would certainly include you okay. Thank you. So, so I guess that Carly had the final question. I'm not sure if you still have time to take the one. Yeah, go on. Oh, it's, I, I don't know. It was kind of more of a, a, not a simple answer, I guess. So maybe for like later. Okay. <laughs> no worries. So uh, I think with this, we conclude our uh, Bioacoustics talks for the day and Alice once again thank you so much for spending this amazing time with us well and thank you for the yeah yeah we look forward to seeing more of your amazing research out there and everyone next our next Bioacoustics talks will be June 13th we will have Kevin Darius with us amazing so st yeah stay tuned <laughs> see you all thank Bye, you everybody thank you so much